uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, I, or good morning, good evening, depending from where you are joining us today. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to FEM 2021, Agnico Eagle, Finland, online event. My name is Sabina Stermic-Palinkas. I'm an associate professor in uh, Ore Geology and Mineral Resources from University of Tromsø, the Arctic University of Norway. And today I will co-chair this session together with my colleague, Tobias Bauer. So Tobias, please introduce yourself. Yeah, also on my behalf, uh, Welcome everybody to this uh, 13th Fennoscandian Exploration and Mining Conference. My name is uh, Tobias Bauer and I'm Associate Professor in Ore Geology at Luleå University of Technology in Northern Sweden. So very warm welcome to everybody uh, to this uh, online event uh, this time. And uh, I would like to hand over the word to um, Jani Lösonen, the Managing Director for Agnico Eagle Finland. Uh, and Jani will uh, give us some welcome words. Jani Lösonen joined Agnico Eagle as Vice President Europe and Managing Director of Agnico Eagle Finland, which has a subsidiary of Agnico Eagle Mines Limited in May 2017. He worked previously as CEO of Ecochem. He graduated from La Penranta University of Technology with a master's degree in industrial engineering and management. And he has also held several senior manager positions at Kimira. So please, Jani, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tobias. And welcome to the second day of Fenoscandian Exploration and Mining Event 2021. Yesterday, we had a pleasure to watch several very well prepared and well presented presentations. So thank you all who were on the stage yesterday. Job very well done. If the theme of the yesterday was more about exploration and, and project development, today we will more focus on the changing business environment and also changing regulatory framework, which is relevant to, to the mining industry. Today's uh, event's uh, main sponsor is Agnico Eagle. And as many of you may know, we are also living quite exciting times at Agnico. In the end of September, uh, Agnico Eagle Mines and Kirkland Lake Gold announced a merger of equals. And our aim is really form a leading company in the uh, mining and especially in the gold mining space. If you look at our position in terms of cost efficiency, in terms of mineral reserves, in terms of risk profile, but also in terms of financial flexibility, going forward, I, I believe that the combined company will be second to, second to none. Uh, we operate in a low risk jurisdiction in uh, Canada, in Mexico, in Finland, and also in Australia. And our strategy has very much been based on regional platforms and building on the strength on, on a regional basis. And this is definitely we, something we will keep on doing also in the future. Also, the exploration has been very close to the heart of, of both companies, and we have invested heavily in the exploration opportunities and, and grown the company from that, starting from, from that angle. And it's also something we will keep on doing also in the future. Uh, all in all, I believe that the compound company will be even more attractive partner to junior uh, mining companies, to the exploration companies, technology suppliers, even to academic work, world and, and all the other relevant stakeholders who are present, for example, in, in today's event. Uh, the deal is expected to close by end of this year or at latest uh, by end of Q1 next, next year. So stay tuned and, and stay in touch with us. I'm, I'm sure that there will be further opportunities to fruitful discussions with the new Agnico Eagle. So thank you for joining and, and enjoy the day. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Alex Christopher from um, uh, PDAC Canada. He's the president of PDAC in Canada. 
and uh, uh, the talk it's entitled Canada's mineral industry critical minerals and opportunities for the future Mr. Christopher it's also senior vice president um, exploration project and technical service for tech resources he joined tech exploration group in uh, 1984 advancing um, through more senior roles in exploration business and corporate development and reaching his current position in uh, July 2016. Uh, Mr. Christopher holds a Bachelor of uh, Science uh, degree in Geology from McMaster University and uh, uh, Environmental Bi uh, Biology Technology Diploma from Candero uh, College. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Christopher couldn't be with us uh, today, but he sent us his uh, video and please join me in, in, the, in the presentation. Hello, I'm Alex Christopher, the President of the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, and I thank you for joining today. I would like to thank the organizers for welcoming PDAC to participate in the event once again this year. Before I start, I want to recognize the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples and all of the locations we're, we're meeting from today. For those of you who are unfamiliar with PDAC's activities outside our annual convention, we're a not-for-profit association with a small cast of dedicated staff and volunteers across a broad spectrum of skills and experiences. And our advocacy efforts focus on fostering a responsible and competitive mineral industry in Canada and abroad. Today, I aim to provide you with a quick financial snapshot of the Canadian mineral industry and highlight some of the co commonalities we see between Canada and other regions. I will also speak to a few of PDAC's top priorities related to critical minerals and supply chains that we work to convey to the federal, provincial and territorial governments in Canada. So let's start with a look at the mineral industry investment dynamics to the end of 2020 and where investment dollars are being spent on mineral exploration in 2021. The chart you see on the screen shows the amount of equity investments in the mineral industry over the last decade and the year over year increase in 2020 is quite evident. Although the pandemic caused operational impacts at varying degrees throughout the year, Commodity prices were up almost across the board in 2020, and this was likely a major driver behind the more robust financing activities versus 2019 and what we have seen in 2021 year to date. For reference, year over year in 2020, the price of nickel and zinc rose roughly 20%, while gold and copper increased by approximately 25%, and iron ore was up 70%. In terms of a proportion of global equity raised, Canadian Exchanges generate approximately one third of all equity funding for the sector, representing the largest Canadian percentage ever in 2020. And while the picture for 2021 isn't yet complete, activity on Canadian exchanges has continued to accelerate, and the amount of equity raised as of the end of September already exceeds the mark set in 2020. Now let's look at how the increased equity investments over the past year have impacted the expiration in Northern Europe. The chart you see here shows the estimated exploration spending within countries in Northern Europe over the last decade. Estimates suggest that the region will see exploration spending increase more than 30% year over year and eclipse $200 million in 2021, the highest level recorded since 2012. This is in line with the roughly 35% increase in exploration spending projected globally in 2021. And Sweden in particular appears to be reaping the greatest reward as exploration spending is expected to climb by an estimated 40% in 2021 versus 2020. Within this context, the expected 60 plus percent surge in exploration spending in Canada in 2021 is remarkable. Unlike Northern Europe, will represent the highest level of spending since 2012. The Government of Canada has defined our national list of critical minerals and is committed to attracting investment in domestic exploration and mining projects and positioning Canada as a reliable and sustainable supplier of choice for critical minerals into the future. Nearly 25% of exploration expenditures in Canada in 2020 targeted the critical minerals you see here. And if we exclude dollars spent on gold exploration, that number jumps to approximately 80%. This represents over $500 million in activities in 2020 and speaks not only to the attractiveness of the Canadian regulatory regime, but to Canada's vast mineral endowment and potential for discovery with respect to these strategic minerals. Of the minerals you see here, we're the world's top producer of potash, a top five producer of nickel and graphite, and Canada represents substantial production of several key green metals. I also want to highlight that the nickel produced in Sudbury, Ontario, represents about 40% of Canada's nickel output and is refined with the lowest carbon intensity of anywhere in the world. 
So I encourage you to look at to the extensive opportunities to pursue these strategic metals within Canada, where there's opportunity to leverage existing physical incentives into new discovery. I wanted to take a minute to touch on some of PDAC's key advocacy efforts. PDAC works to develop recommendations to governments that are intended to drive new discoveries and bolster Canada's ability to be a trusted, sustainable source of the mineral building blocks needed for a sustainable low carbon world. In terms of fiscal incentives, the very successful flow through share mechanism remains a key part of Canada's fiscal regime, representing over 60% of all the funds raised explicitly for domestic exploration. And we're engaged with our federal government to ensure the mechanism's application continues to evolve in step with industry practices. Also, as a result of the continued PDAC advocacy efforts, our federal government has made commitment to expand the mineral exploration tax credit for companies exploring for critical minerals on Canadian soil, which should incentivize investment into grassroots projects. We're also calling for increased public geoscience funding and support for evidence-based land management and infrastructure development decision-making. Of course, I'm very excited about the announcement we made earlier this year that the PDAC 2022 convention being held in March will be a live event with the opportunity for virtual attendance for those not able to attend in person. PDAC 2022 looks forward to welcoming attendees back live and in person in Toronto from March 7th to 9th and online from around the world on March 10th and 11th. You can find details about how to attend and what can be found in each part of the world's premier industry event on our website and stay tuned for updates over the coming weeks. In closing, I encourage you to visit the PDAC website to find out details about the convention and also to, to see the useful information and tools we provide, such as our mineral finance snapshot that analyzes some of the figures I've used today in greater detail. So on behalf of PDAC, I wanna thank you for your time today and I look forward to seeing you all at PDAC 2022 in March. Thank you very much for an uh, interesting presentation. Um, I s don't see any um, questions in the chat right now, but uh, I would have. There are some. Oh, okay. Um, I would have a question for you. Um, what do you see as biggest challenge for Canada's mining industry in the moment? Thank you very much for an uh, interesting this presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Tobias. Um, I hope you can hear me fine here. Um, I, my bad, bandwidth is a little um, limited here. I'm, I'm just out in the field. Um, but I think that when we think about uh, challenges for the, for the mining or, or let's say the mineral exploration development industry in Canada, really, um, I think there's two two main main things here. One is access to land, and making sure that uh, we we have the right regulatory regime and the right system here for, from a land access point of view. Um, and really, we work hard with the government and First Nations to, um, to ensure that 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 happens and that the industry has um, a long long future. I think the other the other key issue here for for me when we start thinking about some of these strategic minerals and um, it really becomes infrastructure infrastructure development in some of the remote uh, parts of the parts of the country and ensuring that we um, essentially provide incentives for um, for for mining and mineral exploration companies to to access the lands that they need um, to to develop and discover and develop these resources um, uh, for for the long term. Okay, thank you. I see one question turned up. Uh, Alex, how do you see the role of public geoscience? Yeah, so I, I'd say public geoscience is very important for the industry. Um, and, and that um, I think when we look at countries that have very strong public geoscience programs, um, they, they generate a lot of investment dollars and they generate a significant discovery. Um, so I think in Canada, there's a lot of work um, uh, with, with, the, with the government um, to to look at um, how we how we develop and uh, and roll out um, public geoscience programs um, and what makes I think a big difference for the industry is is some of that broad regional context that helps them then um, narrow narrow their search range down. So this is a really important. I think there's some great public geoscience in, in, in quite a number of, of countries in the world. And it, uh, I think when we look at um, you know where we should go for exploration, I think that's a big measure measurement or a big factor in terms of how we measure where we should be. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to 
introduce, introduce then our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Elsie Malki, Communications and the Community Relations Manager at Agnico Eagle Finland. Elsie Malki joined Agnico Eagle Finland in January 2021, where she is responsible for communications and community relations. Elsie holds a master's degree in education from the University of Lapland. Prior to the current position, she worked in the Lapland Chamber of Commerce as a vice president. She has worked in several positions in the field of business services, regional development, and development of the business environment. Please. Hi. Next will be presented my video about sustainable mining. Hi, dear participants of FEM conference. My name is Elsie Malki and I work in Agnico Eagle Finland as communication and community relations manager. Today the theme of my presentation is sustainable gold mining. Agnico Eagle's mission is to build a high quality, easy to understand business. One that generates superior long-term returns for our shareholders, great place to work for our employees and also contributes positively to the communities in which we operate. Each field to create sustainable business and create great place to work and to go hand in hand with our communities are equally important. The role of ESG is also important today and I believe its role will grow even more. This means that background work for the future needs need to be done carefully. Sustainable mining, according to Finnish Sustainable Mining Network, among other things, highlights transparency, continuous improvement and taking care of impact of operations on local communities, the environment and the biodiversity. For us, these elements are the bedrock on which we also build our future on. We invest both in technology and innovations and sustainability. We work as partners with universities and equipment manufacturers to develop next generation technologies for the future mines. Good example of that are ongoing projects of decarbonization and electric fleets. We are also piloting advanced automation and autonomous mining as well as advanced water treatment technology and work with our energy efficiency. 
we have invested over 80 million euros to environment investments during the years 2016 and 2020. Employees' health and safety are a high priority for us. We have launched multi-year safety journey program in order to support our safety culture and to develop our workplace safety with the goal of zero accidents. LTR frequency has been steadily declining and we have also managed to address the COVID-19 pandemic successfully. From the very beginning, our operations in Kittira, we have actively collaborated with other companies of the area and we have active cooperation and dialogue with stakeholders. For example, Community Liaison Committee, which is an important forum for discussion on our common issues with locals, was established in 2013. Also, we appreciate and we want to take good care of our cooperation between different industries in the region. We support our communities in many ways. For example, we do continuous investments in education, culture and sports, especially in the leisure activities and well-being of children and the youth in Kittila. In October, we got the Partner of the Year Award from Visit Levy, and we are so proud and grateful for that kind of recognition. The study done at the beginning of this year showed that local residents value jobs in the mining industry and mining itself. For us, this is very important feedback. Local workforce is crucial for us too. Over 90% of employees are hailing from Lapland and 50% from Kittila area. We focus on organizational and individual competence development and well-being and we want to be valued employer. In many fields and in many sense, the work is still going on. Acceptability of mining operations requires We believe that by doing things well, investing in the future, there will be bright future for sustainable mining. Thank you for your attention and have a nice FEM conference. Yeah, so we have some questions for you. Uh, so one of question is, so the company, your company is devoted mostly to gold mining. Um, considering the green shift and need for some other critical raw materials, uh, have you considered maybe to change a bit the focus of your company and to extract some of critical metals that come in association with your, your gold mineralization in your mines? Yeah, uh, Agrico's business is pretty much based on the strong regional platforms. And all those uh, platforms are based on opportunities related to gold mining. Uh, and also the capital allocation decisions are pretty much driven by gold mining opportunities. But we never say no to good business opportunities, especially if they are close to our existing uh, platforms and existing mines where we can utilize our expertise and our competencies related to the mining industry. Yeah, and another uh, question just came. What type of targets Agneto Eagle Kitila Mine has set for future regarding sustainability, like uh, Finmin's TSM system or carbon neutral? So I assume that this kind of already, uh, this was quite similar answer to, to the previous question, right? Do you want to comment a bit more on that? Please go ahead. About carbon <clears throat> neutrality, we have um, set, committed to set the target uh, for net zero carbon um, by 2050. Okay. And then we have two similar questions. One would be on, uh, do you find, so your company, it's active in several countries, in Finland, in Canada, Australia, and Mexico. Do you find enough educated young professionals in these countries? And also the, another question came asking, um, how, what is the proportion of a local workforce mm -hmm. in, your, in your company? In Kittila, we have managed to find very, very good, very skilled uh, workforce, and we are very happy about that. And uh, local uh, local work workforce is, all, is also a very big uh, portion of, of our employees. 90% of our employees are coming from Lapland and 50% from Kittila. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it seems that we don't have more questions at the moment. So thank you again for joining us. And we should keep with the program. So our uh, next presentation comes from His Excellency Jason Toland, Ambassador of Finland uh, in Embassy of Canada. So Mr. Toland um, has a, a bachelor degree in economics from uh, uh, Queen's University and a degree in laws from University of British Columbia. Uh, he joined the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, and International Trade in 1998, uh, following work as management consultant in UK and a labor uh, and employment uh, uh, lawyer in British Columbia. In Ottawa, he has worked uh, principally in the trade, economics, law and policy, and overseas he has served in Buenos Aires, in Washington DC and in Berlin. Uh, his Excellency couldn't be today uh, with us uh, here in, um, uh, in the studio, but uh, we, we have a video that uh, it's focused to the future of Canadian mining, Canada-Finland exploration and mining collaboration. So please join me in the video. Greetings from the Government of Canada to the participants of this 13th FEM and congratulations to the organizers on such a comprehensive virtual program. Given the fascinating technical focus of uh, this week's content, I appreciate the opportunity to pull back a little bit to look at your industry from uh, a broader and governmental perspective. The importance of the extractive sector to Canada is obvious uh, and it remains as high as it's ever been. It's 5% of our GDP, and 20% of our exports come from your industry. That is essential to Canada's economic success, but what's crucial to the success of the industry has been how our miners focus on extraction. Post-pandemic, my government is working on an inclusive trade diversification strategy supported by uh, a set, your sector, by the extractive sector that's responsible and sustainable. You've heard from PDAC about its vision of the industry and in particular the development of critical minerals. As we build a low carbon economy, the importance of these minerals and the people and companies who bring them to market is obvious. One way that governments can support your sector is to ensure a strong social license. It's clear even to those with a limited understanding of your industry how countries like Canada and Finland uh, support the long-term health of the mining sector through voluntary and regulatory efforts to develop that license. One such effort, ensuring uh, an economically inclusive industry, is the Government of Canada's Women Entrepreneurship Strategy, which is a nearly $5 billion investment to increase women-owned businesses' access to financing and talent and networks and expertise needed to access new markets. Now, in that vein, uh, and reflecting tomorrow's discussion on women's role in the industry. I'll mention our support for Canadian groups like Women in Mining, Women Who Rock, and the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, all of which are actively promoting women and Indigenous women's, importantly, participation in the extractive industry. Another element of Canada's approach has been to work with Canadian companies in their engagement with communities and to be champions for the highest industry standards. Some of this is working with international governance exercises like the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative and also through our own national contact point for responsible business conduct and the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise or CORE, we work together with uh, industry to strengthen labour, environmental and environmental practices to support transparency, and eliminate corruption in mining practices. That all together makes for uh, an extremely supportive mining environment in Canada uh, and for responsible Canadian miners. This commitment is demonstrated as well in Finland's robust implementation of Canada's to original Towards Sustainable Mining uh, initiative and in our own importantly industry supported corporate social responsibility checklist for Canadian mining companies working abroad. That list is used by our officials and industry partners to ensure that ESG principles are more than just uh, terms in shareholder reports. 
The objective of these measures is collectively to ensure that countries like Finland and Canada uh, lead in ex resource extraction um, and development in a responsible way. At the same time, respecting the rights of indigenous people and in local communities, as well as improving circularity, managing waste, and minimizing the environmental pr footprint of that development. And these are welcome discussions uh, that I see are elements of this week's program, importantly. In this way, we ensure that the strength of the social license, which in turn improves the regulatory process, makes it easier for your business to make informed long-term decisions about the investments that are necessary for our economies. My government working together with provincial uh, government and with uh, Canadian industry uh, and with Finnish partners, for instance, recognise the need to provide you essential institutional and regulatory clarity. And that in turn is essential if, to make the timely decisions about critical minerals and the sustainable supply chains that need them and that our economy in turn need. Development of critical minerals is a priority identified in Canada's foreign direct investment attraction strategy and our ambition is to use our existing miner, uh, mining and mineral framework to unlock the commercial opportunities partners in need of resources essential to development of the new technologies can use to make our lower carbon economy possible. Now, as in Finland, the Government of Canada is working with PDAC and other partners to build Canada's battery value chain from mines to mobility. Not at the price of our communities, but with them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting video. Um, as you um, seen, Ambassador Tolland is uh, not able to attend uh, this event. Uh, and in the chat, you will find an email address in case you have any questions. You are very welcome to address your questions uh, to the embassy. So with this, we would we can um, go on to our next speaker, and I would welcome Mark. Rahvid is president of Euromines. Mark is the president of Euromines, chairman of Venus Minerals, a director of Green Rock Mining and a consultant to Dundee Precious Metals. He previously acted as a consultant to Eldorado Gold and has held numerous board positions in natural resources companies, companies active in Europe and elsewhere over the last 25 years. He also spent 11 years at the European Bank for Reconstruction and De Development and holds a master from Oxford University. Um, Mark is uh, traveling and not able to attend, um, but uh, he sent us a pre-recorded video. Minister, your excellencies, honored colleagues and friends, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon, albeit from afar, because I am traveling, and I'm sorry that I can't be with you. Um, as you've heard, I'm Mark Rakavides, I'm the president of Euromines, and I'm delighted to be invited to speak at this event, um, organised by Finmin and by Agnico Eagle, both of whom are valued long-term members of Euromines. Euromines is, of course, the organisation that represents the mining industry in Europe. And in that sense, given the short time, my presentation will be about how we contribute as an industry to the EU priorities. So let's go straight into it. Um, there will be a presentation available to you. Um, you don't necessarily have to watch it now, of course. Um, you have to suffer me instead. The priority is, of course, at the moment to recover from the COVID pandemic. Um, the industry plays a critical role in providing the raw materials we need um, for our manufacturing industries and other downstream users to recover from the pandemic. The health crisis has underlined the crucial role of certain sectors, of course, chemicals, pharmaceuticals and the medical sectors, you know, it goes without saying, but all of them rely heavily on raw materials. European mining companies and mining technology companies are essential for European value chains and thus crucial for overcoming post -pandemic, the post-pandemic economic crisis. What's next? We have to look beyond the pandemic, of course, 
and that it entails building a better European Union. Difficult, it seems, given the events of these days, but I am a great believer that challenges produce positive results. We all know that minerals and metals represent the basis of our lives and of any industrial production process. They provide, provide both everyday products and new solution for modern infrastructure and for technologies. It's interesting that we talk a lot about change and in the contents, the context of competition for resources. From, we talk a lot about materials that we already know about. And part of that is provokes a more interesting discussion in the sense that when we talk about coal, when we talk about bulk commodities, we talk about an older co conception of our industry. But yet our industry is always trying to produce what we need tomorrow, not what we needed yesterday. The demand for raw materials is continuously increasing in Europe and globally. We all know that. There's lots of statistics that can be quoted to everyone. Everybody engaged in developing a sustainable Europe relies upon metals and minerals. But those metals and minerals have to be sustainably produced, and it is only by European standards that we can deliver that. European companies are, of course, global leaders in innovation, and what we produce involves the highest standards of environmental, health, safety <clears throat> and stewardship performance. In terms of climate change, the more ambitious our targets, the more metals and minerals are needed for a clean energy transition. That's clear. The, the, our industry has radically progressed in its productivity and energy efficiency. We know this. The Nordic countries are very much leaders in this. I'll come to talk a little bit about how we fit in our trading relationships in that context a little bit later. But still, we haven't stood still. We're still implementing new solutions, aiming at further reducing energy consumption and CO2 emissions. But we have become dependent on highly specialised metals and alloys that require a vast array of minerals and metals. Some are relatively rare, but many are essential and commonplace, and we produce them very well in Europe. Part of that in involves moving to what people call digital sovereignty and therefore providing digital solutions. We all know that digitalization is a top priority for the European Union. And of course, we support these efforts, not least because our own industry. And if you're seeing the presentation, you'll see a wonderful example from Agnico Inkle. Um, not least because our own in industry development of technology simply benefits people and businesses and we contribute to achieving a climate neutral Europe by demonstrating what we do. We have a critical dependence on electronics and therefore we're equally dependent, I would suggest even more so, on the mineral raw materials needed to make them. So therefore for sustainable products, as I've said before, we have to have sustainably mined metals and minerals. And the European mining industry is using innovative techniques to become more resource efficient. We're always looking for synergies. We're always looking to work with other industries. We're always looking to add value. It's interesting that our industry has been very slow in adopting new technologies. And a very simple example is blockchain in terms of logistics and supply chains. We've always been, I think, a bit chauvinistic in the past. It's probably a little unkind but we've always thought that somehow we knew better. I think we're being more open. We're understanding that we can learn a lot more from other industries. And that sort of cross fertilization, I think represents an extraordinary opportunity, not only for our, for our industry, but for our economy as a whole. Part of the function of the recovery progress, the process, I beg your pardon, the Green Deal, is to make the European economy more resilient and robust. So what we need to do is, of course, increase domestic production. I said that, I think, indirectly. We need to become less dependent on external supply and improve our sustainable supply chain in Europe. This is essential. We have our own mineral resources. We know this, including critical raw materials. We have world-class deposits and still huge mineral potential. By improving sustainability, <clears throat> 
and our well-being. Is only, this is only possible through new innovations and better applications. We make the minerals and metals that make these developments possible. Mitigating supply risk, a very, very fashionable, unfortunate term at the moment, supply chain vulnerability. Mitigating supply risk by providing materials for green, sustainable, circular and low carbon technologies will allow Europe's manufacturing industry to move ahead and allow us and allow further investments in Europe's raw materials. We talk about standards, we talk about sustainability, I've repeated the word, but part of this involves defending our common values and promoting our democratic model. We do this by treating people properly. We do this by understanding what we do and why we do it. We work in Europe very closely with local communities that are affected directly and indirectly by what we do. And we strive to work to develop better strategies. I've heard a definition of sustainable mining which says that when a mining project would leave an area better than before it started. And that's a very interesting idea. What do we mean by better? Can we combat, for example, inequalities by understanding statistics, how people live, how they're employed? Can we collaborate with people to improve knowledge, improve cooperation, implement target investments? Can we train people? Can we develop new skills? Can we develop new opportunities, often in areas where populations have been marginalised? Social responsibility is very much part of what we do in Europe. I don't think we're good enough yet in telling other people about it. We're re more readily condemned, obviously, obviously. If you're seeing the slide, there's a child's hand on the model of a truck. It's an interesting, it's an interesting juxtaposition putting together two different things. The EU needs to improve its role as a global actor. The European mining industry is a very sophisticated partner. We're working to share our experience and we develop our performance according to the United Nations goals in sustainable development. We work together also with our partners in other countries. Euromines is very proud to be the rap one of the rapporteurs in the EU-Canada um, mining dialogue. There's a strategic partnership, as you know, between the European Union and Canada and a specific chapter in the trade agreement relating to natural resources. I recommend that you attend virtually or I would hope in person, but virtually the, the event that's going to happen in about 15 days time um, in Brussels. There will be a specific event um, organised by the European, European Commission with the Canadians um, and they'll be focusing on battery metals. At the moment, our focus with the Canadians is to develop specific sectors. We have complementary expertise. They have investment expertise. They have the advantage of space. They have the experience of producing bulk commodities very readily, very easily. What we have is expertise. I've said this before in many presentations. If you look at the flows of materials, it's predominantly from Canada to the European Union. If you look at the flow of skills, expertise, knowledge and people, it's the other way. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I would be delighted to take questions if I was there in person, but sadly, I believe I am on an aeroplane as you listen to me. I wish you a successful conference. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for an interesting video. Mark is unfortunately not able to join us for question and answers. And uh, our next speaker, um, Maria Ostrand, uh, could unfortunately not uh, join the event either. So we are directly continuing with our next speaker. And this is uh, Kimo Kolander uh, with the talk entitled Probably the Most Ambitious Sustainability Program in the World. Kimo Kolanda has held the position of the Secretary General of the Finnish Network for Sustainable Mining since 2020. His professional background includes a 10-year career in the administration of European Parliament and a public affairs entrepreneur. He holds three degrees in political science, agricultural development, 
and business administration. And uh, the talk sounds very curious and uh, interesting. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'm just wondering if you're seeing the presentation now. Not yet. Now we see the presentation mark. Okay. Yes, uh, good uh, time zone to everyone. And um, it's a great pleasure and honor to be speaking here at FEM. I have a limited uh, time at my disposal. So maybe I'll just get down to the business immediately. Finland uh, faced uh, a big uh, decisive moment in uh, <clears throat> 2012 when there was the Talvivara event or incident. The government uh, started working on the issue and uh, made quite uh, quickly proposals on how to improve the situation between the mining industry and the stakeholders. Following this work, uh, the Finnish Innovation Fund Citra started uh, working on uh, an initiative uh, how to get the, how to improve the dialogue and uh, mitigation concerning environmental impacts of mining. CITRA studied a thoroughly different kind of uh, initiatives and uh, ended up in uh, proposing that uh, we start following the Canadian TSM towards sustainable mining initiative. I'm convinced that most of the you people know uh, what the TSM is about, but uh, just to recap that it is a performance system that uh, helps companies evaluate and manage their social responsibility uh, programs. The TSM key points must be pretty familiar to everyone also, so I don't get any deeper into those, but uh, concentrate on the Finnish improvements. Citra had uh, a very ambitious approach from the beginning and thus we created a much stronger institutional framework, which is semi-independent. Semi we are still working under the auspices of Finmin and um, financially we are still 90, 95% dependent on, um, on Finmin, but uh, uh, at our board, we don't only have uh, representatives of stakeholders, but stakeholder organizations are represented in the board. And uh, we work on consensus, so everybody must agree on anything we decide upon. We also have one additional protocol compared to the uh, original Canadian TSM. It's about the closure of the mines. And since the beginning, we have also demanded the participants to publish their CSR reports on our website. We have uh, started with a framework for exploration also. We have had a couple of uh, pilot projects and hopefully next year we have a fully functioning program coming up. From the more or less technical side, we have this, uh, these sustainability standards, but we also create an arena for uh, voluntary action and uh, self-regulation and also a forum for uh, debate, discussion and uh, dialogue with uh, most of the important uh, stakeholders towards mining industry. Our chairperson is um, Dr. Hannele Pokka. She has been working as minister and uh, before her retirement uh, as the secretary, no, the 
Director General of uh, Ministry of Environment. We are now facing a kind of um, turnaround point or facing a new dawn in our organization. Since we are publishing the first results of uh, self-evaluations of mines uh, this January, the verification process has been ongoing since uh, last summer and the uh, last results will be available, available, available in January and then we are going to have a major event where we publish all these. With our work we have uh, created not only the platform for uh, dialogue and tools for uh, companies to improve their work. This uh, five-step uh, or five-level grading also creates uh, a very handy roadmap for companies to improve uh, their work. And uh, for the civic society and stakeholders, it also uh, gives structure to the debate when different minds and um, businesses can be compared on a standardized scale. Our future development now when we are renewing our strategy include um, a slight shift towards more like a sustainability community instead of this uh, classic rigid uh, organization, but um, work is still ongoing, ongoing there and uh, <clears throat> We hope to create some uh, results on that also during next year. Thank you for your attention. I end my presentation here. Yeah, thank you uh, for the nice presentation, Kamon. And we have some questions for you. So uh, one of the questions that we got uh, through chat said, um, how would you describe the stakeholder's attitude towards Finnish sustainability program? What is the key thing to make the program to work for stakeholders too, so that it doesn't just serve the mining companies themselves? Thank you for these very pertinent questions. I think it's been pretty wonderful that uh, WWF and the uh, Finnish Union for Nature Conservation have been able to have a very constructive, pragmatic dialogue during these years, and uh, that they have been able to create this kind of very ambitious setup, uh, not only institutionally, but content wise. So, this is really remarkable. And uh, thanks go to all the participants in these organizations. Plus, the ones uh, who I didn't mention, but uh, whose name you saw on the list. And the second question was, can you repeat it, please? And then uh, there is another question. So um, uh, your network brings together uh, industry and NGOs, uh, local uh, communities, and, and many other type of stakeholders uh, in Finland. But uh, other countries in um, in other Nordic countries, they are kind of facing the same challenges and as mining in Finland. So, yes, we are in constant dialogue with our colleagues in Norway, who also belong to this TSM family. The Swedish industry is still uh, reflecting on which. Uh, standard they are going to use, and uh, we have um, advised them uh, in that process. So thank you again for your presentation and for your answers. And we will move, move forward with um, uh, our talks. So now we have a block of three uh, presentations coming from three Nordic countries. Um, I will first introduce uh, Erika Altonen. She is Senior Advisor, uh, Mineral Policy from Department for Innovation and Enterprise Financing, Ministry of Economics, Affairs and Employment in Finland. Rika has experience from Mining Authority, both at Ministry of Economics, Affairs and Employment and at the Finnish Safety and Chemicals Agency. 
prior to that, um, Rika also has a strong background in mining industry in Finland and Sweden. Tobias? Yes, I would like to introduce Randy Skirstad Grini, director at the Directorate of Mining with Commissioner of Mines at Svalbard in Norway. Randy Skirstad Grini holds a Master of Science in Engineering, Geology and Rock Mechanics from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, specialized in environmental geology. She has been director of DMF since 2013. Her main tasks and priorities have been implementation of the Minerals Act of 2010 and the necessary reorganization and modernization of the agency. Digitalization and user-oriented streamlining of application and reporting processes are major, major focus areas. Prior to her position at, as director of DMF, she has a broad experience from consulting, research and management. Sabina, please. Yeah, and uh, the, the uh, uh, last speaker in this um, in this block will be Susan Gielsho. She is a desk officer, um, division from um, Sectors and Industry, Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation in Sweden. Susan holds a degree in geology, as, uh, and she currently is working uh, with issues related to mines and mineral areas in the Ministry of Enterprise enterprise and innovation. Prior to, to this, um, um, she also holds uh, more than 15 years of experience in the area, working both in public and private sector. And now I would like to invite Rika Altonen to join me here on the stage. So please, Rika. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to, to give you a short insight on legislative situation and, and what is happening at the Ministry of Economic Affairs in Finland. Next, please. Uh, we have a government program from 2019 with a very timely objectives, climate neutrality, resilience, energy and raw materials efficiency and, and circular economy, all very important um, issues also for mining industry. Then there is a list of activities in order to increase and improve the environmental performance and safety of mining whilst securing the operational environment and increasing influence possibilities for landowners and municipalities and then uh, uh, separate activities concerning taxation. And there I can inform you that the government decision in September this year uh, is that mining tax is to be uh, introduced in Finland. Uh, it's to be enforced 2023 and uh, it shall collect 25 million euros and that will be divided 60% to the municipalities and 40% to the state. More details uh, come later. Next, please. Uh, uh, at the Ministry, uh, we have several activities ongoing. Of course, uh, a lot of legislation that concerns mining is uh, developed. So. Uh, we participate in, in different projects in the Ministry of Environment, and which is, it, which is the main, main uh, ministry, of course, with land use, nature conservation, environmental protection and so forth. Um, concerning taxation, it is the Ministry of Finance that is, uh, that is the place. And there, as I mentioned, there is the decision on, on introducing mining tax. At the same time, the statement of energy taxation changes for mining industry was uh, uh, withdrawn. So in that sense, the, o the only activity is the introducing of mining, mining tax. Then, of course, we are preparing uh, changes to Mining Act. And uh, the hearing procedure is to be carried out and the parliamentary process will be spring 2022. And all the preparation material is published at the ministry website, uh, unfortunately only in Finnish, but anyway, there is a lot of material, so I recommend to you to check that through. We have had a working group to, to support our preparation, and we also have, uh, despite of these uh, very unusual times, uh, engaged uh, public. So we have arranged three web-based 
research uh, events for, for the public and uh, we have had more than 500 participants in these events and all that material and also those streams are, are to be viewed at the web page. Uh, then uh, the most recent one is circular economy um, activity. So, of course, mining waste, a big issue. Uh, utilization of that and value creation of that. We had a very good report uh, published last summer and now we are working uh, uh, in order to get uh, fulfilled the actions to actually make, uh, make uh, most and more of those or uh, those waste streams. So uh, we will keep you posted, but that is something that is, is actually uh, getting realized as we speak. Next, please. Uh, we have an uh, intensive list of, of uh, studies that has been used uh, in order to prepare the, the changes in the, in the Mining Act. And there I will uh, highlight only the two last ones, uh, a weighing of interest as a part of permitting process. That report will be published in January. An interesting uh, point uh, maybe to be added in the legislation. And, and then a very recent one, mine waste collateral and prodding of its field. That project has only started and the report will be finished uh, in one year. And these are all uh, studies that have been financed by the government. So it's not only the ministry. The ministry reports are uh, the one on collateral in mining permit and the reservation notification. The rest is uh, joint uh, projects from the whole government. Next, please. Uh, uh, I will sum up with some of the suggestions we have in the in the draft for proposal. So there will be a lot of more more detailed provisions in order to be given in the in the permits, uh, more uh, requirements for uh, reservation notification, uh, including a tax type payment that is based on the size of the area. Uh, re more requirements on informing the locals and other stakeholders. Some companies already do that, that but now we will make, make it a must for everyone. Um, then there will be need for more detailed information uh, on what is to be included in collateral. And there we have a very good cooperation with Ministry of Environment and also environmental authorities and mining authority when we are looking in that. Then uh, there is a proposal of landowner acceptance uh, as a precondition for continued exploration. And uh, our suggestion is uh, more than 50% of the area and after 10 years uh, of exploration. But that is to be confirmed later. What is the uh, final proposal? And then uh, municipal land use plan uh, is proposed to be a, a requirement for my mining permit. And that would enforce the local influence as well as, as be a means of coordinating the different land uses and different interests in the area. And with that, I thank you. Yes, we hear you well. You hear me and you have my slides, please. Um, okay, then thank you. As we are gathering here today, Another important meeting is going on in Glasgow. If their plans are to be successful, our industry, the mineral industry, needs to succeed. We all know that the world will need increased amounts of sustainable minerals in the years to come. And we are all at the core of making this possible. But that demands mutual effort from both the authorities and the industry. Next slide, please. This is a mining project in planning today. At, le at least it is how I hear from some of you explaining the feeling of entering a labyrinth of authorities, regulations, and subjects to be investigated. And we all know that mineral projects are extremely complex. Gives potential high profit, but also requires huge investments. The projects are often followed by high conflict level, significant environmental impact, and high risk. 
And it is clear that these kind of projects require thorough documentation and a wide range of permits, not only for the authorities, but also for the investors. To be able to fill the gap between the amount of critical minerals which are available and the amount we know is necessary for the world to be able to reach the climate goals, we all need changes. Today, I will give you a brief introduction to the ongoing processes in Norway on the regulatory basis. Next slide, please. One of the main regulations for a mining project in Norway, not the only one, but one of the three most important regulations is the Minerals Act. And the Minerals Act is, at the time being, underlaying a thorough revision based on the main recommendations from the Evaluation Committee some years ago. One of the most important recommendations is better coordination between the Planning and Building Act and the Minerals Act, and also better coordination between the Environmental Act and the Minerals Act. Another main area is better framework and procedures for mining projects in areas with some interests, which is a huge area in the ongoing revision. The Minerals Act Committee shall make their recommendations uh, on the July of the first next summer. Next slide, please. I will also inform you that there has already been some adjustments to the Minerals Act, with the effect from the 1st of July this year. One important improvement is that the operating licenses now can be transferred on certain terms. And there are also now some new requirements for competence for all mineral activities. This has not come fully into operation yet, but will be for the benefit for the professional applicants. Next slide, please. But as we all know, regulatory work takes time. And time is something that we all lack to transform to a more sustainable future. We have now a mutual understanding in Norway amongst the industry, the authorities, and the politicians that there is a need for better coordination of the processes. And our new government has already put sustainable mineral production on the agenda. To be able to find the good solutions, we need cooperation. We need to find and to use the possibilities within the existing frameworks. And we in the Directorate of Mining are now looking into how we may contribute to better coordination by guiding the local communities advising the industry and other authorities to find their way through the labyrinth. And I am asking you to contribute with your competence, with thorough planning and documentation, because a prerequisite for these processes to be predictable and efficient is, of course, that they are thorough and correct. But most of all, I am asking you to contribute by innovation to find more sustainable ways of mineral production. In this way, we can all contribute to a more sustainable future. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you for this opportunity to briefly present some of our ongoing policy related initiatives in Sweden. I uh, can have the next slide, please. Uh, Sweden's mining industry, it's really important for Sweden as a country, both on regional and local perspective, as the extraction of metals and minerals are important for jobs, welfare, as well as the green transition, of course. Sweden's ambition is to continue to be a pioneer in the mining industry in terms of innovation-driven and sustainable development. Modern and efficient permitting process are a priority issue for the Swedish government. The permitting process and in minerals and mining area are regulated both in the Environmental Code and the Minerals Act. Uh, next slide, please. 
In the beginning of this year, the government gave an assignment to a special investigator to review the current perm permitting process and regulations in order to ensure a sustainable supply of innovation critical raw materials, both primary and secondary sources. The investigation should propose changes and measures required to achieve a better consideration, consideration both the project's environmental impact and its societal benefits, such as reduced global climate impact. You should also see which changes can be made so that a larger share of the value generated by the mining sector can benefit the entire country. This assignment will finish in about a year, in October of 2022. Next slide, please. Many companies in Sweden have long expressed that permitting and licensing process takes way too long and it's not very transparent or predictable. More efficient and predictable processes for environmental and climate improving investments in Sweden in combination with continued high environmental requirements can lead to a faster green transition. So this is very important to us. And in August last year, the government decided to investigate the possibilities for streamlining the environment permitting process and appointed a special investigator to do this. This issue is handled by the Ministry of Environment. And the overall objective of this is to propose changes to speed up the process make it more predictable and contribute to a green transition. This assignment will be reported in the end of May next year. Next slide, please. Uh, Sweden aims to be the world's first fossil-free welfare state and Sweden's emissions are to be reduced to net zero by 2045 at the latest. In December 2019, a special investigator was appointed to review the relevant legislation to achieve Sweden's climate goals. This is also handled by the Ministry of Environment. And this assignment will be finalized in the spring of next year. In December of last year, we, the government appointed a coordinator for issues related to societal changes in major industrial establishments and expansions in the counties of Norrbotten and Västerbotten, as this play an important role in the green transition. Several major business establishments and expansions are going on in these counties. For example, Northvolt, H2 Green Steel and Hybrid, as well as initiatives from Bolid and Anelkabe. The coordinator will act sort of a, as a link between different stakeholders and will contribute so the initiatives made at a national, regional and local level are well coordinated and complement each other. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, and thank you all, all three of you. Um, I don't see any questions on the chat, but uh, maybe I would have a, a question to all three of you, and you could choose who who is answering. Um, what would you say are the biggest differences between the three countries? I I'm, I'm very familiar with the Swedish system, but not so much with the Finnish or, or Norwegian systems. So do you, do you see any major differences um, be, between the countries? You, you can also all three comment. Rika. I can, I can comment on this. I would say that there are more similarities than changes because all three countries uh, obeyed the the directives that come come from European Union and that that makes the the framework rather similar at the end of the day 
the, then of course the devil is in the details, but, but the, in, in the big picture, we are very similar. Okay, thank you. Um, we also received a question through the chat now, um, and this is addressed to Rika. Uh, can you, Rika, assess a bit uh, the parliamentary process regarding Finnish mining law? What could be expected of the schedule-wise? realistically in terms of having the law in force? Um, unfortunately, our parliament is very independent, so I don't dare to say anything about that. I can, I can only say that the, the parliament procedure will, will, uh, will be uh, started next spring, but, but that is where our um, work kind of stops. We, we prepare the, the proposal and then it is up to the, up to the politicians and the parliament to, to decide the rest and, and they will take the time they need and want. Thank you. And we have one more question in the chat. Uh, and this is to the three of you. Uh, what is your view on how the Nordic mining industry can speed up the permit process to meet Europe's demand of minerals to enable the green transition? Long permitting process is an issue in all Nordic countries. And I wonder how the presenters from the different countries look at this. Perhaps I could try to comment on that one. Uh, because I think that is, this, this is a, a joint responsibility between the authorities and the um, projects because, and the industry. Uh, because I think we, we are, as I was talking about, we, were, we are now looking into how to both make the uh, legislation better, but also how can we uh, use the opportunities within the existing framework be, by getting actually more sustainable projects. I think that is the key. Uh, from my view, I would say that there is a, a, a strong will of coherence between the different permits and also kind of a, a will to, to uh, go towards a one-stop shop sharing of information between uh, different authorities, different, uh, di different materials, so that, so that the applicant doesn't have to uh, produce the same material several times. So I think the better coordination and, and also at the end of the day, high quality applications. So that is a big responsibility that the applicants, that the, that the companies have, that they produce good quality applications that, that will speed up the, up the processes. Yes, and I have to agree with my colleagues uh, and what already been said. Uh, and also we hope that our investigations will come uh, with good and relevant proposals uh, to speed up the process. And I think it's also a question on uh, resources to uh, relevant authorities uh, to actually be able to, to make this quickly. And yeah, one important you. thing is that we, sh we share then whatever we find that could speed up things, we share it with our neighboring countries. Very good. Um, and we have one more question, and this is uh, addressed to Randi. Um, is seabed exploration mining taken into consideration in the current laws, or has it been brought up uh, in these reviews? Uh, seabed mining is regulated in a totally different law, actually. So it's not regulated in the, the Minerals Act. And it's, uh, it's also a, quite a new law. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. So with this, um, I would like to thank all three of you. And uh, we go to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Henrik Schiller, Director for Geological Resources and Environment at the Geological Survey of Norway with uh, the talk entitled What's Hot in Fenoscandia? Current Players and Upcoming Commodities. 
Henrik Schillerup is Director for Resources and Environment at the Geological Survey of Norway. He has a PhD from the New Norwegian University of Science and Technology and a Master's from the University of Aarhus in Denmark. His primary background is in igneous petrology and mineral resources. Since 2001, he has been working at the Geological Survey of Norway, both as a researcher and in various manager roles. He has been division director at the survey since 2019. Please, the floor is yours, Hendrik. Uh, thank you very much, Tobias. Um, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to give a presentation on behalf of the geological surveys in Finland, Sweden, and Norway, which will hopefully give you an impression of the prospectivity and mineral potential of the Nordic part of the Finnoscandian shield. I need uh, from the beginning here to thank my colleagues at GTK and STU for their contribution to this presentation. We all think that the mineral potential of the three countries is, is actually best presented in a holistic way like this. So the plan is to give you an overall idea of uh, what is currently being produced, what does the immediate future look like, and what are the trends in exploration. So my hope is to convey the impression that the three countries are still hosting a considerable uh, resource potential. Um, um, yeah, both Finland, Sweden, and Norway are part of the Finno-Scandian shield that you see down to the right. Uh, there are many similarities across the shield, um, but there are also important differences, uh, which um, they are to a large extent obvious, also when it comes to the prospectivity of different commodities. The most important um, uh, first order geological feature is uh, different orogenic histories, leading to a, a younging trend from east to west, which you can see on the map. Um, the large map is very busy. This is how it's supposed to be. It's showing the activity across the, across the area. Uh, the background map shows um, all the current exploration permits awarded in Finland, Sweden, and Norway. You see the intensity of blue coloring is highest in Finland, somewhat less in Sweden, and considerably lower in Norway. And this is how the picture has been looking for many years, actually. In addition to exploration activity, the map also to some extent reflect, or the blue colors at least, to some extent reflect the different jurisdictions. So the data displayed are not exactly similar for the three countries, but it, it comes pretty close. The labels show main commodities of interest for each country. And this spectrum of interest, as you can see, is very wide. It's not easy sort of to, to generalize from this picture. Um, commodities are, ho are hosted by provinces across, across the, uh, the Nordic countries, but there seem, for instance, to be a tendency for more PGEs and special metals toward east, uh, but if in, uh, definitely more titanium uh, towards the west. Um, so for each country, let's have a look at the, the mining country, Finland. Finland has uh, nine metal mines and 36, 36 industrial uh, mineral mines in uh, operation. The map shows metallic ores and industrial mineral mines in Finland and the size of the symbols reflect the amount of ore mined in 2020. Um, after this map was produced, mining has uh, ceased in uh, Kulilati and uh, Karpel in Kulma mines. The majority of the mines in Finland are, are actually small industrial mineral mines and more than half of all production is concentrated into the two biggest mines. These are the Sotkamo mine, uh, run by Terrafame, uh, mining nickel, zinc, cobalt, copper, uh, with a yearly production of uh, uh, 17 million tons. The other one is Kevitsa, which is run by Boliden, uh, mining nickel, uh, copper, cobalt, gold, and PG. Um, Mining of metallic ores uh, was record high in Finland in 2020 with 32.8 million tons. And Finland is the only EU country with mine production of, for instance, chromium and cobalt. Uh, you could also say that the mine at Seal in Järvi is the only apatite or phosphate mine in Europe. And uh, uh, with Finland in the EU, uh, Finland is the biggest producer of platinum, palladium, and nickel, as well as one of the biggest producers of, of gold and, and, uh, and talc. Um, when it comes to mature projects, what's in the pipe, pipeline? This is a fairly long list of mature projects covering, uh, uh, sorry, 
uh, yeah, this is a very long list here, um, like covering commodities from lithium and phosphate to various uh, nickel, gold, and cobalt. Um, the mature projects uh, have seen significant new developments uh, recently, uh, including that uh, there are now new resource updates from for, uh, several of these deposits. There has been advances in permitting, so new mining permits have been granted at the Kaustinium, that's a, a lithium project, and also at the Sealindyard with phosphate mine. Um, there's been a major acquisition, which is a Sockley mining project, which has changed hands. It was acquired by the Finnish Minerals Group from Yara. There's also been new partnership announcements, uh, again, Kaustinen and also the Hautelampi projects. There are two, two gold mines which are about to restart. These are the Liva and Pampalo deposits. Um, when it comes to exploration in Finland, we see, uh, we see a lot of gold on the short list here. Recently, uh, exploration uh, activities have been concentrated in central Lapland with a focus on gold, uh, but also some nickel copper exploration uh, for Sakati Kivitsa type deposits. The most significant recent find is the Ikari discovery in 2020, uh, where we now have a maiden resource published in uh, this year. Of 49 million tons carrying two and a half ppm gold. Exploration is also ongoing at the LK deposits. That's a nickel copper project in a two and a half giga year layered intrusion. Um, and there are active exploration projects uh, uh, or the developing projects that also at the other gold, gold prospects on the list here. So um, Sweden. Um, I have to say the figures on this slide are all contained resources. So Sweden has 13 metal mines in operation. And Sweden is, as we all know, a large producer of iron with five operating iron mines in northern Sweden. Uh, Kiruna, Malmberget, Livenemi, Mertainen, which are all operated by LKAB. The fifth deposit is the Kaunisvara deposit, which is operated by Kaunis Iron. Uh, Kiruna remains the largest deposit. For base metal, Sweden has uh, six operating mines from ITIC in the north to Sigruven in the south. Of these, ITIC, uh, which is operated by Boliden, is Swedish, Sweden's largest copper mine and it's also Europe's biggest open cast mining operation for copper. The ore production is on the order of 45 million tons per year, uh, working on a fairly low grade deposit. In addition to copper, also gold, silver, lead, and tellurium are produced. Um, gold is a uh, subsidiary to several of the Swedish uh, mines, but there are also two actual gold mines. These are the Kankberg and Björkdal deposits, both in this uh, left district. Um, there are a number of mature projects in Sweden as well. These include uh, the two copper projects in northernmost Sweden, that's the Viscaria and Nautenen projects. Both of these are historic mine sites and feasibility studies are on the way for both deposits. Um, there are a number of gold projects. The Fabuliden, Basele and Vendel Grantele deposits. These three deposits are all uh, located in the so-called gold line. And of the three deposits, Fabuliden is uh, most mature with mining procession in place and test mining has been undertaken. The Rare Element Project in Nora uh, that has been running for a number of years. Uh, it's an alkaline rock hosted deposit with relatively high grades of heavy rare earths. Uh, we should also keep the Bergby Lithium Project on the radar where there's drilling and testing ongoing. The Remap Project uh, and the two graphite projects on the list here, Voxner and Visangi, uh, represent new trends. And I have uh, returned to these in, in the next slides. So the remap project um, that is aimed at the tailings from the Kiron and Manberg at Iron Mines. At both these deposits, tailings are rich in apatite. Um, and the plan is to produce a pure apatite concentrate from the tailings. Uh, there's an addition ambition to separate both REEs and chlorine during the apatite processing. And also gypsum produced in the process uh, will be sold. So because of the enormous size of the tailings and, and the considerable apatite content, the supply potential is large both for the phosphates and also for the rare earth elements uh, to cover a, a big part of uh, both Swedish and, and European demand. And production is expected to start in, uh, in 2027. 
Um, there are two significant graphite projects under development in Sweden. One of these is the uh, Voxner deposit. Uh, the Voxner deposit is, um, is actually an existing mine with a, a partially exploited open pit. This deposit holds uh, four separate deposits under exploration concessions, but uh, the PEA uh, has considered only one deposit in the uh, in the updated mineral resource estimate. It's called the Kringle deposit. The estimate is on uh, 2.6 million tons at 9.13% uh, graphite. So, and the ultimate objective of production of Voxner is uh, Sweden-based uh, advanced node materials production through the Sikona battery technologies. Um, there is, however, also another important graphite project in, uh, in the Vitonki area in northern Sweden, um, and in particular the two twin deposits at Niska and Nunasvara uh, are under development and a feasibility study has been completed this year. Um, um, with almost 20 million tons in between these two deposits uh, and uh, you have 25% graphite in the indicated resources, these uh, the deposits here constitute a large European source for natural graphite. There's uh, an additional uh, potential for expansion of the resource base in the future. Also here, uh, it's a Telka group who's involved here and they also plan a battery and node production, also Swedish based. Norway, um, the Norwegian minerals and metals production look quite different from Sweden and Finland. Um, in the late nineties, Norway and Finland had the same number of metal mines, but this picture has changed a lot over the last decades. So today the Norwegian production is highly dominated by industrial minerals with uh, graphite carbonates, with the world's largest production of olivine, Europe's largest production of uh, nepheline cyanide and a very important production also of, of uh, in particular high purity quartz. So when it comes to metal production, Norway has two major operating assets. Uh, that's uh, Rana Gruber in uh, North Central Norway, working in neoproduzoric iron ore with a job compliant uh, tonnage of uh, more than 500 million tons. In the south, we have the Telnes, uh, Telnes mine. Uh, Telnes is one of only three or four hard rock ilmenite deposits in operation in the world, and it is also the largest titanium mineral producer in Europe. So Telnes provides some five to seven percent of the world's titanium raw materials. There's been some measure of iron production from the Sydlanger uh, banded iron formation in northernmost Norway. You see it in parentheses here, but I will return to that in uh, under a minute. Mature projects, um, you will have heard or will hear some of these, some of them in uh, in other presentations, both on the exploration side and mature mature projects. So the Nusia deposit, it, it's a sediment hosted copper deposit in Nusia. It's fully licensed, uh, mining concession came into place in 2019 and DFS has been published. Um, it is supposed to be exploited in parallel with the neighboring uh, Ulvoigen deposit. And together the two deposits contain resources of, uh, yeah, defined resources of 77 uh, million tons of copper, uh, copper ore uh, carrying more than 1% copper. So copper is a traditional Norwegian mining commodity through several hundred years and when when Nusia opens, as we think it will, uh, it will close a production gap of more than 20 years. Uh, Engebu is also one we have uh, sort of presented a, a number of times. The Engebu root hill deposit is quite unique as a project uh, as it targets root hill in hard rock setting. The total tonnage here is 450 million tons with around three and a half percent titanium oxide dioxide. The tonnage of garnet uh, is immense in these rocks with a content of more than 40%. Uh, these are rutile bearing eclodites, and uh, the garnet represent an important part of the values here. Uh, Nordic Mining published at DFS in 2020, and the deposit has a defined reserve base of uh, 63 million tons. Sydlanger so, so iron to the north, um, it's, um, it's an Archean magnetite quartz banded uh, iron formation, and uh, appears very close to the Russian border. It was mined continuously from 1910 to 1997, and again from 2009 to 15, yielding more than 200 million tons of ore. So care and maintenance production has been going on, at least intermittently, since uh, 2016. Uh, it has now been taken over by Takora Resources early this year, and it's licensed for full reopening. I've also included Nasafrit quartz deposit on the list here. This is a high purity quartz deposit developed by Elkin. Just of the um, 
the highlights um, on the exploration sites. Uh, this one you may have heard about yesterday. Um, the Bergkamp Sogndal deposit is hosted by a neoproterozoic land intrusion in South Norway. Uh, the deposit has been regarded as an important asset by the Geological Survey of Norway for many years. Uh, in certain stratigraphic levels, the layered rocks contains more than 30% apatite, ilmenite, and vanadian magnetite. So the V205 content of the magnetite is close to 1%. And Morgan Mining initiated a drilling program here in 2019. And they have so far extracted uh, almost 50 kilometers of drill core. And um, their work has defined a job compliant resource of 1,790 million tons. However, um, you can say the grades used in the assessments here have been set fairly low. Um, the film carbonatite in South Norway is a classic locality. The carbonatite has been mined for iron and for niobium, and actually also for phosphate in earlier times. And today, the film complex is primarily interested, interesting for as a host for rare earth elements. So this complex has been mapped in detail by the geological advisors to the uh, counties involved in Dahlgren and with the mapping supported by shallow drilling. So the areas which you see in green on your right uh, comprise uh, coarse grain, ferrodolomite, carbonatite, and rich rare earth elements. Uh, one drill core extracted contained an average of 1.7% total rare earths over a core length of 700. Uh, 716 meters. So drilling programs are actually just starting up uh, by some of the companies uh, active there during the coming months. Uh, the last example here describes the back to graphite here. So Scarlet graphite mine on the uh, on the island of Sende is it, that's the largest flag graphite producer in Europe, uh, and it's fourth it's the fourth largest outside China. So it is presently the world's highest grade operating flake graphite mine with a mill feet grade, uh, averaging 25%. It's a total resource of 1.8 million tons and operated by the Australian company Mineral Commodities. So the Geological Survey of Norway has been working quite intensely uh, through many years on a regional scale and has defined a number of additional possible targets through, uh, through both uh, geophysics and ground surveying. So this has enabled companies to better target exploration and development. And, and as an example, in 2020, Mineral Commodities added one of these projects also to their, to their graphite portfolio. Um, sort of to sort of sum up here, because this is, this is my pitch for Finoscandia. Um, I hope I have managed to demonstrate that uh, there's a very significant mineral potential uh, which we are exploiting and, and may be exploiting in the future. Um, in addition uh, to the, our geological uh, fertility, we have, uh, we have excellent infrastructure. The service have open databases and lots of data to help anybody looking for anything. Uh, high security societies, uh, we have downstream production actually in all, all countries. And we also have the European markets very close by. Uh, these are also significant assets here. So um, just on behalf of the three geological surveys, I, I would really like to invite both explorers, miners, and investors to look for more uh, opportunities in our region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henrik, for the nice presentation. And we have some questions coming in the chat. So uh, how do geological surveys try to stay on the pulse of what would be beneficial to produce in the future? No crystal ball, though. So, is it nowadays? Um, I suppose research and uh, and the projects that uh, geological surveys are conducting mostly driven by um, EU levels or maybe national agendas. We, we, uh, I guess there could be different answers from the three three surveys, but uh, there's a lot of signals coming from the outside world, and uh, there's a lot of signals coming through Europe. So also for Norway, which is not an EU country, uh, the signals from Europe are, are really important. But of course, of course, uh, the markets are, are the ones uh, sort of uh, uh, identifying the demand. And uh, uh, we see the exploration companies coming in. We have our own research projects uh, directed uh, at, at certain, certain commodities. Uh, so it's an interplay of a lot of factors. Actually. And then I have one more question. So, yeah, you have shown that there are many geological similarities, though there are some differences uh, in geology of these three different countries. But also we can see a strong difference in, in the mining sector developed in Finland and Sweden comparing to Norwegian. 
So do you see any changes uh, in communication with, uh, with companies um, with recent um, refocus in Norway from oil and gas sector and going more to green shift? So do you see that uh, there is something happening in mineral uh, sector in Norway these days? Um, you can say that the uh, oil companies and the service providers uh, offshore um, they have uh, they saw a, a big opportunity in uh, in the exploration of for, for seabed minerals. Uh, there are also uh, companies involved in uh, you, you see a lot of uh, yeah, at least you see some technologies which are, are the, the technology companies are trying to apply onshore. We have examples of that, um, but I don't think we have seen. Uh, we have not yet seen uh, offshore exploration uh, turned into onshore by, by the same companies. But we see a lot of activity in Norway as well. Uh, usually we see the peaks coming in, in in Finland and Sweden before they arrive in Norway. But, uh, um, yeah. So, yeah. So we hope that we will see further development in Norway as well on land. Yeah, thank you, Henrik, for, for the presentation and for, for answering the questions. And we will move um, to our program, with our program. So I have a great pleasure now to invite Maria Ostrand, uh, Vice President um, from Active Minerals uh, Northvolt, Sweden, to join us. Uh, Maria will give a talk on the battery uh, metals prerequisite for enabling the, the future of energy. Uh, and Maria has been with the Northwold since January uh, 2019. She is the Vice President of Active Materials, including Metals and Process Development of Cathode Active uh, Materials. Um, before this role, she was um, uh, involved in activities uh, as a Managing Director of uh, SWEA. Uh, camp and uh, also she had the different roles with both R&D and uh, manufacturing at Sandvik uh, Coromand. So Maria, please, the screen is yours. So uh, I was asked to talk a little bit on the battery materials and how they are a prerequisite for, for the future of energy. So uh, I will uh, run you through a few thoughts from, from the Northfall side. Uh, first of all, uh, I just want to give the full value chain uh, overview here. And of course, what we are talking about is on the very left hand corner of this graph. So it's more in the mining refining, going into metal uh, and chemicals for, for batteries. Uh, so that's uh, the two parts that we talk about when we talk about upstream. We also include in upstream the manufacturing of the active materials, so both the cathode and the anode, anode uh, materials. But right now and today, I will focus more on the extremely left-hand side, which is actually outside the Northfold scope, and that's the mining and the refining of the different metals, and why it's so important for us that this is something that we work on together with you guys. Uh, upstream for us is, of course, uh, very important. On a footprint point of view, you can see here our facility in labs. It's not the biggest part, uh, but it's definitely the highest. So the, the upstream facility, what you see here in the, in the picture is the very left-hand side of our factory. And as you can imagine uh, on the factory that we are con currently building and where I am actually also located right now in Skellefteå, this upstream part is even uh, bigger, of course. Uh, I think it measures a total of 45 meters high. So it's really the highest uh, part of, of the battery manufacturing plant. As you probably know, uh, we, we target the nickel, uh, manganese, cobalt uh, cathode material. And for the nickel, manganese, cobalt, 811 chemistry, there is a lot of metals needed. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, with the forecast projected by EIT you know, Energy going for uh, 400 gigawatt uh, hours per year uh, in 2025, we approximately need 600 uh, plus kilotons per year of cathode active material. This corresponds to approximately 600 or more exact 590 kilotons per year of precursor. And for this, we need an enormous amount of nickel sulfate, cobalt sulfate, manganese sulfate, and lithium hydroxide. So all in all, you can see that the need of these metals, the very critical metals to, to make the NMC uh, cathode active material, it's really an enormous uh, quantity that we would need uh, in the future. And 2025, I think is not too far away. 
uh, we see a lot of different market activities. So, I mean, the NMC uh, 811 chemistry is one, of course, but we see all, also another uh, chemistries uh, coming uh, alive. And of course, we see a broad shift generally in this industry going towards the more high nickel NMC chemistries. Uh, reason for that and the logics uh, behind that is that we want to increase the energy density of the cell to make it volumetric uh, efficient. Uh, this means that we can get more, more energy density or more energy into, for example, a car uh, vehicle uh, per volume um, required. Uh, but we also see uh, a lot of low cost materials like uh, LFP, the iron based uh, material that is uh, gradually increasing and more and more capacity is actually being announced in, in Asia. So, so this really drives the cell cost uh, reduction. Uh, and of course, one can have a few questions on the on the sustainability of those material, uh, but it's really uh, increasingly uh, attractive uh, to produce this material. And uh, what we also see is that there are a few patents that are expiring. So I think we will see more players also manufacturing this, uh, hopefully also in Europe in the coming future. Uh, there are other chemistries, of course, than the, the LFP uh, that uh, represents the low cost chemistries. But what we see is that those being, for example, high manganese or sodium ion batteries, those are really in the very, very early stage of development. And I don't think we, we can see those chemistries coming uh, into market in, in many years uh, from now. However, it's a really interesting landscape of, uh, of other low cost chemistries coming up. Uh, and I think that we, we can see uh, quite a big drive for this uh, cathode uh, materials, more, more low cost cathode materials coming uh, more and more interestingly uh, for the customers as well. Uh, I mean, historically, the, the electric vehicle is quite often a premium car, but uh, going also into the budget vehicle segment, uh, the, the customers ask more for, for these uh, uh, lower cost cathode and uh, maybe lower lower capacity um, cells as well. So, so this is uh, something that we will see more and more of in the future as well. Uh, and of course, I mean, looking at the cathode manufacturing, even though many, many cathode manufacturers are communicating their uh, establishment of additional supply, uh, the, the, the supply versus demand is still uh, a huge gap. And I will show you our recent numbers on that. So coming to this, of course, there's a very rapid uh, battery market uh, growth. Uh, and as you can see, we, we estimate that from 2018 to 2030, so only 12 years, uh, we see approximately 19 times uh, the need for the battery metals. And we see that this is uh, driven uh, all through the, the, the world. So on all, all continents, of course. Uh, what we see is that also uh, the electric vehicles the demand for the bulk lithium uh, is really uh, capturing that. So what it, the, the cathodes and the materials coming, uh, the battery chemistry is coming, is requiring quite a lot of lithium, uh, which is a, uh, it's, it's um, very important for us in the in European context. Uh, when we look at the, the ability that we have right now, and this is a, an example only on the lithium, so this uh, applies for, for all the metals, of course, is that on the top uh, picture here, uh, we see the feedstock production or the process ca processing capacity uh, right now. And of course, we see that both the feedstock output being coming uh, primarily from Australia as hard rock or from South America as, as brine in the lithium case. Uh, in Europe, we have a very, very small uh, bar on this uh, graph, uh, of course. And uh, even if we look uh, further ahead uh, and project the European uh, demand and processing capacity, we can see that the blue bar on the bottom graph here, it represents the, the, the demand that we have in Europe. And of course, uh, the, the right hand bar uh, being then the processing capacity announced in Europe, uh, it's, it's significantly lower than this one. So this is really something where we emphasize a lot and we would like to see a lot of more uh, and new initiatives in Europe. So looking at the, the raw materials in general, uh, I mean, we have the, the lithium, uh, which I mentioned uh, just now. Uh, of course, the hard rock is coming from Australia. A lot of the conversion is happening still in China. Uh, the brine from South America. Uh, we see quite a lot of uh, large mergers, very interesting uh, consortiums are, are uh, putting together uh, as, uh, as, of, um, 
as of now. Uh, and we see that uh, a lot of uh, capacity is either pulled back uh, when, when prices are low or, or when prices are high, as is the case right now. We see that uh, many projects uh, are becoming more, more active to establish. Uh, even if we don't have all the NMC, but we actually go for the LFP, so the, the lower cost cathode, it's still a need for the, for the large uh, quantities of lithium. However, there is a little bit of a convergence between uh, the so-called technical grade and the battery grade, so depending on the purity of these materials. So they are converging depending on, on uh, what we see on the low cost and the high cost uh, or the premium kind of cathode materials. Cobalt, uh, I think we all uh, know that, I mean, uh, Congo is the world's largest producer of that. And uh, I think the, right now, the situation as we see it is that the prices are above long-term expectations. Uh, we see hydroxide, uh, which is the feed for sulfate production, uh, is improving in, in terms of availability. Uh, but at the same time, I think we, we also know all that the, the cobalt uh, supply Will, uh, will also be very important to come from, from the recycled material. Nickel is maybe our uh, most uh, concerning area uh, right now, especially going for the high nickel chemistries. So we see that uh, quite a low uh, portion of the demand uh, for the class one nickel is coming from the batteries, but it is increasingly, uh, rapidly increasing uh, in the near future. We see new projects coming up, uh, new capacities being added, but uh, it is nothing in, in uh, the near of, of uh, the supply need that we have. So we really believe uh, that the shortage will be uh, continuing uh, on the nickel. And also there are, uh, there are methods to, to produce sulfates from the ferro-nickel. Uh, however, we believe that this is uh, not the most cost efficient and also not the most sustainable uh, uh, process. So, so we, we look very positive to, to see new ways and new uh, feeds of, of uh, nickel sulfate. Uh, when it comes to manganese, it's actually less critical. Uh, it's also less costly than all the other cathode materials. Um, and also we, we have a rather low content uh, of, of manganese in, in our cells. And, uh, but still, uh, what is happening is that, of course, when, when manganese is used for batteries and not for, for stainless steel uh, manufacturing, uh, the purity of the materials becomes increasingly important. So even though it's a less critical uh, metal, uh, the quality of the metal is, is still important. Uh, so, uh, as you probably all uh, are aware of, or hopefully, uh, we are uh, on the mission to, to create the greenest battery. Uh, in the world, having a very low carbon footprint uh, and also a very high ambition for recycling, uh, targeting 50% uh, recycled metals uh, in our cells 2030. Uh, and uh, we look at many guiding principles when we kind of feed uh, feedstock ourselves or, or uh, procure our metals. Of course, we want to have a stable supply, a long-term uh, supply of the metals. Uh, the, the suppliers should be best in class uh, in terms of sustainability and uh, with that comes also the need for traceability so we know where the metals comes from all the way uh, back to the mine. Uh, it uh, still has to be very cost, uh, cost competitive of course because our customers uh, they want to, to have uh, cost efficient uh, batteries in their uh, cars and the energy storage. And we really emphasize a lot on the local uh, value chains uh, and regional supply. So a little bit on our raw material uh, work, definitely short term, we look at diversify feed mix to get good flexibility, meaning that we need to have different kinds of feeds uh, as we, we do see a shortage in some of the of sulfates, we need also to keep ourselves flexible. Uh, we work with very established operators today and we contract long term supply agreements with these operators. Uh, and we always look at the commercial and the compliance uh, with, with um, uh, sustainability so that we get good raw material feeds. But we have a lot of localization discussions with key suppliers and how can we support as a customer uh, to, to uh, facilitate and enable a raw material value chain uh, more locally. Our more long term focus is, of course, that we want to increase the regional sourcing. So even though we don't do it ourselves, we, we uh, work intensely with different uh, institutions and, and uh, stakeholders to, to support a regional sourcing strategy. 
and uh, we really support those projects and new establishments coming up in the Europe. So, so uh, if uh, we can do something to support and help out from, from our customer perspective, this is where we want to be. Uh, of course, we collaborate a lot also with our already ex experienced partners, partners that we already work with to see their uh, journey uh, towards growth. But we also maximize the recycled material, of course, to, to not be dependent on, on virgin material um, as well. So this is a little bit what we do in terms of raw materials. Uh, looking at the, the, the market, of course, it's easy to, to, to look only at the price, but actually everything below the surface is, is much more important uh, for us. And it's a lot about, of course, on the quality of the materials, the impurities and the, the processing methods. Also how sustainable uh, the processing is in terms of byproducts, uh, CO2 footprint and uh, mine lives and, and, and such things. So we work with all those things uh, with our suppliers. Uh, on our roadmap, we are targeting to, to uh, have a battery cell that uh, does not contribute with more than 10 kilos of CO2 uh, per kilowatt hour. Uh, and of course, for us, uh, the key driver here is the manufacturing, where we believe that we can bring down the CO2 from the, the market uh, average on maybe 100 uh, kilograms per kilowatt hour to 50 by having energy and resource efficiency in our factories. And this is one of the reasons why we are based in the Nordics uh, with the green energy and the, the hydropower. Uh, of course, we are doing everything we can to source and replace fossil fuels. So for us, it's also important that we, we uh, do whatever we can to, to uh, work as sustainable as possible. Uh, also the very local supply uh, in green electricity, uh, which is also something that we have uh, worked intensely on to, to source our electricity in, in a good way. It's easy in Kuleftio, it's less easy in some other parts of, of uh, Europe. Uh, the second uh, key key area here, which will bring uh, bring the CO2 down by an additional uh, fifty percent, going from fifty kilos to twenty five, is that all the raw materials that the, we source uh, are sourced responsibly, and that we have uh, good recycling processes uh, for for raw materials, and we really close the, the loop uh, in in uh, the process of collecting bat batteries. Uh, crushing them and making them into black mass, getting them into our um, recycling uh, process in Skellefteå and into battery grade metals for, for the cataract material. Thirdly, uh, we look at also other uh, emission factors, of course, where logistics is, is uh, a key driver here. Uh, so we are working on, on uh, green transport and green shipping uh, and working with different uh, suppliers uh, of, of uh, those uh, uh, services to to uh, to add uh, as to reduce even further the CO2 footprint, uh, and of course we measure the environmental impact uh, in many different categories to to really track every gram of CO2 that we can can uh, capture so that we can reach our target of of 10 kilograms. Uh, and of course, for that reason, and this map we have al already seen uh, by, by uh, Henrik and others, so uh, we see that there is a very nice landscape in the Nordics. And of course, this is really something that we would like to emphasize and, and uh, stress that we think it's super, super important that we become one uh, key uh, mining region also for the battery metals in the Nordics. Uh, and uh, looking at the, the key metals here, the lithium, the cobalt, the nickel and manganese, there are many opportunities, uh, but time is a little bit against us on this. And I think this is uh, maybe the, uh, one of the main purposes of this workshop or this conference. So uh, to capture everything, I mean, uh, this is a, a messy or a very wordy slide, but uh, it kind of captures the message that we would like to convey. Uh, I mean, today there is really a gap to be filled. We see uh, that the demand uh, for the battery metals from Europe is uh, significantly larger than the supply. Uh, we we uh, only supply uh, approximately 3% of the global metal need, uh, but we, we need approximately uh, 20%. So we need to increase this in Europe, of course. Uh, and also that the refining capacity of raw materials is far behind the establishment of, of battery manufacturing also going ahead. So not only are we a little bit lagging today, but we also see that the forecasts are, are significantly lagging. So this is something that we have to 
to bridge this gap. Uh, there is a super interesting area, and I think this is something that we would like to, to emphasize to all our students uh, and all our uh, upcoming engineers in this, that there's a lot of innovation that can happen here, both in the manufacturing technologies, but also novel processes uh, to reduce production by uh, production of byproducts or, or uh, enable chemical recirculation, but also to reduce the need of water or production of wastewater. We also see very positive on the on the upcoming projects. We have a few in Europe uh, where we uh, use uh, disposed mine tailings uh, for for uh, extracting metals that we need. This is extremely positive, uh, and of course recycling of battery cells and materials and securing a full traceability. So there's so much innovation that this must be the absolutely most interesting area for a student to to jump onto uh, by far. I think in Europe, we really have the opportunity uh, here and now. I mean, we have a very good infrastructure supporting industrialization. Uh, we, we know that we have a local value chain to minimize the logistics, but we have this infrastructure. So just continue to develop the infrastructure uh, to, to make ourselves uh, top, uh, top uh, class uh, in terms of logistics. We also have a very stable political situation in, in Europe. Uh, of course, we have stability and uh, democratic uh, countries. Uh, so sourcing from Europe is really uh, suitable for long-term stability. And by working together, uh, we can definitely go fast. So we can uh, manage this going forward. And I think we should also make sure that uh, we support uh, in any way we can. Uh, so the politicians can allow raw material projects to start and to grow uh, further. So definitely in the Nordics, uh, we have an innovative cl climate. We have a long material tradition, strong mining experience. We have a significant engineering expertise and a good research foundation and a good industry here for this. So we definitely have the prerequisites to, to be good. Good, so that's all I had to say. Uh, just to conclude, the opportunity is definitely here and now. So um, let's work together. Okay, so yeah, so then I will take some questions for, for Maria. Um, yeah, so we have a question asking, uh, is your company involved in some of um, active mining projects? So do you uh, support funding in research of mi mineral commodities in Nordic countries? No, so we, we, uh, we actually don't, uh, according to the, to the value chain I presented. Uh, we, we don't go into mining. We, we don't want to be a mining company. I think we should uh, uh, recognize that the challenge to, to uh, manufacture cells and, and modules as we do, uh, but also manufacture the cathode active material already there. We have a very, uh, uh, I think, uh, intense vertical integration. And that uh, together with the recycling industry, I think we, we are pretty... Uh, heavily involved in many parts of the value chain as is. So we don't engage in, in mining uh, per se, but uh, when it comes to, to support, I think we definitely want to support and do whatever we can do to help uh, out uh, for this industry to grow and, uh, and uh, uh, industrialize uh, as fast as possible. Yeah, thank you for the answer. I think that there are a few more questions in the chat. So, Maria, if you would be so kind to answer them in the chat, because we are a little bit behind the schedule. Uh, and uh, now I have a great pleasure to introduce our last presenter for today, Mr. Um, Mika Rippi. Uh, Mr. Rippi is the, yeah, and please join me, Mika. So uh, Mika is the county governor of the Regional Council of Lapland. He started this position on March 1st, uh, 2013. And previously, he has been the uh, multi uh, director uh, in Posio, uh, town secretary in Hapavesi, and senior advisor uh, uh, the Department of Ministry of the Interior. Um, Mr. Rippi holds master's degree in administrative science, uh, majoring the municipality uh, jurisdiction. Also, Mr. Rippi is the chair of the FEM steering committee. So, Mika, please, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Sabina. Uh, dear participants, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends of the uh, FEM, uh, normally in this situation I would say that it's a uh, great pleasure to see you all. Now I can't see you, uh, anyone, but I know that there are, there are a lot of you behind the screens that I've been seeing before in, in Levy in earlier FEM conferences. Uh, uh, one of the reasons why we uh, actually decided to, to have this uh, FEM uh, online version was actually that uh, there are so many of you who have been uh, sort of a part of the FEM family and participating in the, in the levy. Uh, we thought that uh, this uh, kind of online conference would be some kind of a uh, boost and, and uh, show that uh, even the pandemic can beat the FEM and, and beat the possibility to, to, to share uh, 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 future visions about the, about the industry, both mining and, and exploration. Although I know that there are a lot of uh, uh, tasks to do uh, uh, in order to have, have this kind of a online conference uh, uh, to organize and so I'd like to also uh, uh, take this opportunity and, and uh, uh, give uh, great thanks to, to all who have participated to, 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 to this event, uh, all the organizers, uh, of course all the companies, all the stakeholders and most of all, all of you who have participated and joined us today, uh, yesterday and tomorrow. Um, still, uh, within two years, in 2023, I'm, I dare to, to uh, say that, that then I would like to see you all alive in Levi, uh, in Lapland and in Finland. Um, today's presentations, uh, we've uh, heard a lot of uh, interesting uh, issues concerning the, uh, the future of the uh, uh, industry, uh, concerning the uh, changes in, in uh, uh, framework, uh, legislative framework, and also uh, also uh, a big framework on, on, on in, uh, for example, in, in climate change. And if you think about the, the situation, we are, we are actually now in sort of a nick of a time, and, and of course the, the climate change is, is changing everything. And uh, when we th think about the, the future of the industry, uh, I think that it will play uh, it will, it is playing now, but it will play in the future a very big role uh, in, in our joint uh, efforts to, to beat the, the climate change. The electrification of a society, society uh, uh, energy revolution, um, we will need more critical minerals in the future. Um, and uh, especially in the European Union context, I, I believe that uh, there will be a lot of efforts uh, to, to uh, uh, increase the self-sufficiency of, of European Union uh, in, in critical minerals. That means that, that especially here in the north, in the Fennoscandian area, we will see uh, in the future a lot of activity, both in exploration and, and also investments. Um, and um, we, will, we have seen it all, already, for example, in Lapland. Um, when we th think about the situation, in the same time, we are, we are having um, uh, quite active political uh, discussion uh, about the legitimacy of, of the mining industry. And as we heard today, uh, there's a lot of uh, changes going on in the legislative uh, framework. Same time, we must say that uh, the companies uh, uh, in the industry, they are doing actually, uh, just right now, uh, many times more things than the legislation uh, is, is obligating. So uh, I'm quite confident that uh, the future of the industry is bright. And uh, uh, if you think about uh, the, the, the big goals, I believe that the sustainability, responsibility, and fact-based dialogue are the key issues that we need to emphasize in the future. And as we saw actually and hear actually today, the companies, for example, the Agnico Ecol, has raised the sustainability and, and responsibility in, in, in their uh, high priority. And also uh, 
we heard from the discussions in the in the in the wide stakeholder forum uh, here in in, in uh, Finland that the dialogue is actually going on quite fast. So I'm very confident that the f uh, future will be bright. Uh, dear participants, now I believe that uh, today's session is is uh, over. Uh, I hope that you uh, enjoyed, and we will see you tomorrow again. Thank you.